Hello everybody, welcome to Wine Library TV. I'm your host, Gary Vay, Nur, Chuck, and this is Wine Library TV. So you see I have my little uh, cell phone, not my computer, and that's because Twitter has a cell phone capability. I noticed a lot of the maniacs have not, you know, just all signed up for Twitter and might not realize that you can have your stuff Twitter to your phone. This way, if you're not sitting by your computer, you'll know that we're on the air and you can ask the questions. I just Twittered about five minutes ago that I'm going on the air and people have already been sending in messages. I just got one from Randy Hall. Man, it seems too early for me, West Coast time, to think about wine questions. Good job, Randy. But already, uh, uh, C. Davis 7 gave me a great idea which was to Twitter out the topic. So I've done that. So now you even know what today's topic is so you can tailor make uh, your questions. And now my mom's calling me. I mean, you never know what's going to happen on WLTV. That's the, the whole thing. Sorry mom, I can't pick you up but I still love you. Happy birthday again. So today's topic is something very important to me. I've been talking a lot of trash. I'm talking like Mayweather, De La Hoya trash, Hulk Hogan trash, you know, what you gonna do kind of trash about Portuguese wines, and especially Douro, this region that I've called the next Napa Valley. Um, and today we're going to do three Portuguese wines, and what's really important about today's episode is this. I think Portugal is known for value, and I talk about that all the time, what kind of screaming values under 10 to $15 there are in Portugal, sometimes under $8. But what I'm really excited about is the high end of this area. And this is something I don't believe a lot of people have really given a lot of thought to or are respecting. Today's wines are all between th about $28, $30, $32. Just got another Twitter. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're really, really high-end wines. And uh, I think they bring a lot to the table. And I, I, more importantly, I believe that there are values in those price points as well. And so today's really exciting for me because all three wines were scored 92 points by Mark Squires, who is the guy who runs the forum at Robert Parker's site, and a long time uh, friend of mine, oh, I've known for a long time before his bulletin board became part of Parker's site at Mark Squires' site, was a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about uh, tasting these wines. As the Twitter keeps going on, this is really great. I'm telling you, put the, uh, put the uh, I am, you can do, AOL IM alerts too, so you can really stay in touch by not being on the site. And there's Twitterific, which is a great download that you need to seek out. Vaniacs, this is going to be a big part of the show. I really want to use this tool. I think it brings the level of interaction to another level. So, let's get into uh, the first wine. As a matter of fact, somebody asked me, will I be doing some special offers through Twitter, like free shipping, and I gave them this answer. Wink. Also, for the live episode that we're going to be bringing back and doing more often, we're not going to crash now because we'll use Twitter to interact with each other, or at least with me, and then we'll try to... Anyway, here we go. Right off the bat, let's get very serious. Let's do the Alves de Sosa. Uh, this is the Domingos Alves de Sosa Doro, 92 point squires, 28 US dollars, and this is the Quinta di Valle Raposa single vineyard, and this is a blend between uh, Quinto Ruiz, uh, Torriga Nacional, and Tinta Cal, three indigenous grapes. You'll see a lot of Ruiz and a lot of Torriga Nacional in these wines. Uh, those are two real intriguing... Do you smell that? I mean, this bouquet is really bringing the thunder, even from a, from a faraway land, as I am right now. This is Torriga Nacional and Tinta Ruiz bring such thunder, are such great grapes, uh, grapes that, that bring a lot of character and structure to wines, and I'm really excited about trying this wine. Again, 20, 28 bones, 92 points, Mark Squires. Some tremendous color right off the bat. Really excited about that. Beautiful nose, wow. Get a very aromatic fruit component, almost like a, uh, almost like a fruit soup. I don't know if they... Do they do fruit soups? I know in Russia they have a fruit compote, as they call it, and it's really good, and you get a lot of watermelon and berries and, and oranges, kind of like a sangria. A little bit different, though. Definitely a fruit soup. I get a little bit of that on the nose. Really dark cherry, really interesting blackberry. Real cool, the question's coming in. We'll be answering some of them. Really nice spiciness to it. A lot of fruit. Good, really, really obvious black pepper. It's fun. This is going to be an eye-opening, 
classic episode of WLTV. I think a lot of people, if they can afford it, and if they're willing not to be close-minded, are going to have a real epiphany, a real life-changing wine experience after today's show. Because I'm telling you right now, these wines are extremely exceptional. Man. Really great dark licorice flavor. I get a really nice hint of beautiful, fresh, expensive Cuban cigar aspect. Nice leather box. Little hints of cedar. Tremendous complexity. I'm having a little bit of fun here now. Um, nice, nice earthy tone. A little bit of venison going on. Bright, explosive, well balanced, extremely smooth for the tannins. So it's new world like in that aspect, but very old world in its flavors. Uh, it's it's not a fruit bomb. It's more of a structured, reminds me of very good Bordeaux with hints of burgundy aspects to it because of the flavor profile with what's great about Australia which is that weight and that bright excitement. I mean this really has it going for it. It's like looks, brains, and a good job kind of thing. This wine is really, really spectacular. Uh, I'm going to also, I'm going to score this wine 92 plus. I'm going to plus up Mr. Squires. This is drinking like silk. Very beautiful bottle of wine, the kind of wine that you definitely want to have with dinner. And to me, once again, you're going to pay $50, $60 from Bordeaux and California to get this quality. This is an exceptional effort. Kudos. Oh, man. You see that? You saw that? Lizzie's going to kill me. All right. Let's move on. Once again... Really interesting stuff. Um, this wine, God, this is heavy. This wine is also uh, Sosa, uh, Alves de Sosa, but this is the Quinta di Javosa 2000 Vintage Doro. Heavy. After a big workout, it's a, it's a tough wine. And again, this is Tinta de Rodiz Tariga, and Tariga Nacional as well. 2000 Vintage, a little bit older. Uh, this has got uh, Tinta Sao as well. And this one, excuse me, couldn't see it. $33.00. Um, and uh, and you're paying for at least 15 with the glass. It's awfully heavy. Again, 2000 vintage compared to 2001. Different single vineyards. Same producer. A great producer. As the Twitter keeps blowing up, I'm telling you this is the way to go. We're going to be answering some questions in a little bit. It's going to be a lot of fun. Very nice. Very nice. All right. So I'm getting excited about that. A little bit of a tighter nose than the 01. Um, uh, I'm definitely getting a little bit more of a tight nose. I'm getting a little bit of, of uh, a greenish kind of fungus, moldy, kind of Moss Man, He-Man style. Big shout out to He-Man. Especially Moss Man was a great action figure. Get a little moss on this. Getting a little hint of escargot. A little snaily on the nose as well. Definitely earthy, no question. And I like that. But tough. you got to really get in there for that. Good complexity, great richness, nice mouthfeel. A little bit more one-dimensional than the Raposa. Um, the Javasa is a, a little bit lighter and, um, and a little bit more off-balance. Still has really nice Kirsch Royale flavors, um, getting really sour cherry. You know those cherries that are almost like white? You get They get a little sour. Um, yeah, not as exciting, definitely intriguing, definitely has good mouthfeel. As good as the uh, as the rapasa, but really not bringing the thunder as much as I thought it would. Nice underlining red and yellow peppers, which I like quite a bit. Um, but again, pretty simplistic in its approach. Uh, that bothers me, but very well made and really once again as good as many thirty to forty dollar Bordeaux's. With the, with the earthiness and the structure. Um, I'm gonna score this wine 89 plus. It's not really bringing that much to me. I, I could have felt it would have been a little bit better. Uh, I'm a little disappointed with it, but it's definitely something that, uh, once again, shows great character and, and, and overall good body. I mean, it's really 
once again, a, a wine that I don't think a lot of people realize is being made out of Portugal. I mean, this is serious juice, and there's definitely people that might like this more than I do. Let's move on. The Quinta Val di Maria Doro 2000, and this is very, very serious little winery, 36 US dollars. This has Tinta Amerla and Rufe and Tinta Baraca and Ruiz and National. It's a real serious blend. Um, 14.5 alcohol, again, 92 points. Mark Squires, who Robert Parker has now had do the Portuguese section, which is really good because Mark, I thought, did a great job with this issue. And let's give this a whirl. Really nice color. Probably the darkest of the three for sure. Um, really like that. Let's give it a whirl. And we've got a totally different line on our hands. Let's get into this one a little bit. Very, very bright, bright strawberry jam. Rhubarb pie even, really nice. Real good, it's got a lot of nice dark chocolate. I get that milky dairy aspect again. A little hint of that oak, not the oak monster though. Really viscous, it smells thick. It smells like real classic strawberry reduction sauce that you would put on a cheesecake, but the real stuff, not the crap. I mean, you know, the handmade stuff, really nice. Let's give it a whirl, this has got a lot. Cherry bomb sweetness, I mean this is really spectacular. It's like walking into a classic, you know, uh, bakery and sampling some of the finest, you know, cream puffs. You know, it's got a real creaminess to it. It's got a real cream puff aspect. Again, with that strawberry syrup on it, um, because it has a nice strawberry characteristic, but it's very fruity, very dark, very complex, very rich. I mean, this wine is bringing the thunder, and it's bringing it hard. I mean, this is good. Real good. Great tannin structure. God, I've consumed more wine in this episode than most. I mean, these wines are good. Um, great complexity, uh, very rich, and very smooth. Again, once again, showing that polish of a $50 to $75 Bordeaux or California Cabernet. $36 is not inexpensive. It's downright expensive for a bottle of wine. We should all be so lucky to be able to afford that. But in the wine world today, it's like a house, you know, a house is expensive, but you know, sometimes there's a good deal in a house. If you bought a million dollar home for 800,000, you did good. And that's kind of how I look at this wine. This wine brings the thunder big time. You know what, it, it's a good step above the previous two wines. I'm gonna score this wine 93 plus. I think this is one of the more refined, polished, fruit bomb, old world style wines that we've had on WLTV. And I'll be honest with you, I've never had the 04 of this. I've had those two wines before, and I'm completely blown away by the overall quality of the Valle de Maria. I mean, it is really, really spectacular. Smell that, shrubber. I mean, you have to. It's nuts. Mm. I mean, it's, it's yeah. serious. I mean, this wine has some of the biggest bouquet of any wine and has such a distinct... You know what it smells like? It smells like... um. Like classic strawberry big league chew. It really does, right? It's like got classic candy strawberry. I mean, the nose is really profound. I could smell this wine all day and I may. Let's get into some of the Twitter questions. All right, here we go. C. Davis, Gary, I read somewhere that has been a steady increase in wine consumption in the U.S. Is this true and it will affect the wine cost? C. Davis, seven, correct. The U.S. is on pace in the next couple years to become the biggest wine consumption country in the world. It's unbelievable, we've passed France. It's just nuts what's going on. Um, will it affect costs? I think so on some wines with supply and demand, that's the way it works, but I also think that people are gonna see these studies and start bringing so much wine to the US that you can have a glut. So it's really classic business. Do I see it affecting some prices? Absolutely. As the top wines become harder and harder to get, you're gonna see it, like we saw with 2005 Bordeaux. But. I think you're also gonna see enormous opportunity as people overestimate the market and make mistakes. Somebody just tweeted right now. Let's go right to it. It's Sandeman, and that's my good friend over at Viddler. Viddler's doing well. If you're having any problems with Viddler, let us know in the comments today. Oh, okay, I'm getting pounded here a little. I second answering Colin's question. I've always wondered that. Okay, I'm gonna have to find Colin's question. Randy Hall says, what's the difference between high-end wines from Doro and port wines? I mean, other than the amount of alcohol. 
Obviously, Randy, we did still wines today, not fortified in the port style. So obviously there's a major difference. But Portugal has been so known. I'm glad the questions are happening. I didn't even bring up port. Obviously, all of us know about port, and that's so classified as the high-end stuff. And it's so interesting and intriguing to watch what's happening in Portugal now as people are starting to make high quality still wines, I am completely taken aback by the overall quality of Portugal and will be dumbfounded, absolutely flabbergasted, and completely shocked and appalled if Portugal's not a major player in the next five years. And you're gonna be buying premium wines from Portugal. All right, let's see what else we have here. All right, that's not a... All right, Larry Half says, if you don't know Magnolia, it's an amazing website, Larry. Gary, Bordeaux question. How does one begin, oh, a broad question. How does one begin navigating wines through Burgundy? Obviously Burgundy is a very complicated area. Even I still stumble on Burgundy. Burgundy is very complex. Navigating through that is probably one of the toughest things. I honestly think that Burgundy is the one place you need to read about in comparison to any other place in the world. And, with wine, it's the one place where you need to taste a lot, read a lot, um, start Burgundy wine tasting groups, get four or five friends, use Wikipedia, other sources, watch Wine Library TV, other cool ways of that manner, but it's really difficult, it is a tough, tough place, and the wines are expensive, it's an expensive kind of little habit or collectible thing to get into, but some of the greatest wines in the world are from Burgundy, Pinot Noir has obviously become very big in the US, and I think, uh, I think there's a way to do it, it's just very expensive and a lot of time. Let's move on. Wine Pal says, having homemade spaghetti and meatballs tonight. Made yesterday. So this is the next day. Mm. Your recommendation, please. Homemade spaghetti and meatballs is always calling for Italian wine, but I'm gonna throw you a little loop. I did something not too long ago, experiment with my friends. We actually drank Gewürztraminers from Alsace with with spaghetti and meatballs. We were trying different things to mix up classic meals with things you never thought of. The pairing was exquisite. If you're looking to get a little crazy wine pal, go out and seek a Gewurz. Barms Boucherie is a great producer from the Alsace that I love so much. I think that could be a tremendous combination. You will be absolutely shocked by the balance and what the Gewurz brings to the table. And I'll do one more here. Let's see what we got here. Okay, here's Colin, because he'll get upset if I don't do it. Colin says, I opened a bottle of red wine last night. How long do I have before it becomes only good enough to cook with? Colin, this is a very broad question. We're gonna need you to get a little bit more specific. But that being said, um, red wines can really last three days open on a counter or 15 minutes. It really depends on the pedigree and the quality of the wine. Uh, I find a lot of the wines that I drink, which are a lot of times between $12 and $35 a bottle, can easily make it through at least another full day. And I like leaving it open on the counter, even without the vacuum in or anything of that nature. Wine is much tougher, we've talked about this, much tougher than people give credit to. And uh, yeah, that's right, throw up the big, uh, big uh, biceps. And uh, I really think that it's, uh, it's something you need to uh, experiment with. And once you find a wine that lasts two or three days, you need to buy that up because that's a great way to go. More Twitter came in and it's Randy Hall again. We'll just keep flooding you with questions until your taping is done. Um, question of the day is this. Twitter, what are you waiting for? Sign up and put it on your phone. Really, what's your concerns with technology today? That's my question. I know a lot of people have emailed me back about privacy and different things. I'm just curious, what's your concerns with where the world is going with technology? Because look what we're doing here. I mean, it's unbelievable how this all works now. The world's changing. And you know what other world is changing? You, with a little bit of me, we're changing the wine world, aren't we?